Okay, so we're going to practice determining whether or not a compound is ionic, polar covalent, or nonpolar covalent based on electronegativity values and our scale, which if you can recall, from 0, 0.0 to 0, 0.3 is nonpolar covalent, from 0.3 to 2.0 is polar covalent, and anything greater than 2.0 is considered ionic. And so what we'll do is we'll determine for each of these based on their electronegativities in this scale whether or not they are ionic, polar covalent, and nonpolar covalent. So we'll start with hydrogen sulfide, which is H2S. And remember that we're subtracting one of each electronegativity value. So hydrogen is 2.1 and I want to know what is the difference between the 2.1 and sulfur's 2.5 and this gives me an electronegativity difference of 0 0.4 and you'll see that 0.4 falls in our polar covalent range and so this would be labeled as polar covalent. That means that there is an unequal sharing of the electrons between them. To be very specific, it means in the bond between the hydrogen and the sulfur, the sulfur has more pull on the electrons and so there's an unequal distribution of the electrons and sulfur has a stronger pull on them. And so I'm going to kind of draw an arrow in the direction of sulfur just to say that it's pulling on the electrons more strongly. Also, we label sulfur as having a partially negative charge and hydrogen as having a partially positive charge. And this is only going to occur when you have a polar covalent bond. Okay, so let's look at uh, number two, which is cesium sulfide. We have cesium and sulfur. Cesium is 0.7 minus sulfur, which is 2.5. And that gives me an electronegativity difference of 1.8. And 1.8 falls in my polar covalent range. Once again, here's your chart at the bottom. And so this one is polar covalent. And the, elect the element that will be partially negative is sulfur because the more electronegative element is always going to be the one that is partially negative and cesium here is going to be partially positive. Number three is chlorine sulfide, monosulfide, and so chlorine is 3.0 minus sulfur which is 2.5 giving us an electronegativity difference of 0.5 and you'll notice 0.5 still falls into the polar covalent range. Sulfur, I'm sorry, chlorine in this case is more electronegative so the chlorine actually has the partially negative charge while the sulfur has the partial positive. This means again that chlorine has a stronger pull on the electrons over sulfur. Okay, we'll, um, calcium chloride is next. And so we compare calcium, which is 1.0 minus chlorine, sorry, before, here's chlorine over here on the right side. Chlorine has a char an electronegativity of 3.0 giving us an electronegativity difference equal to 2.0. And because it equals 2.0, that's going to fall in the ionic range. As soon as it hits 2.0 or greater, it's ionic. So we'll label this ionic. That means that the electrons literally transferred from calcium to the chlorine. So calcium has a positive charge overall and chlorine has a negative. Not partially, completely. Okay. Next is oxygen monochloride. Put my all right. There's our scale. Okay, we have oxygen and chloride. And again, oxygen is electronegativity 3.5, so 3.5 minus chlorine, which is 3.0. And this gives me an electronegativity difference equal to 0 0.5. And 0 0.5 falls in the polar covalent range. So this one is polar covalent because chlorine 
is more electronegative, I'm sorry, because oxygen is more electronegative than the chlorine is, oxygen is more electronegative, it will be the partial negative charge and chlorine will be the partial positive charge. Okay, BRCL, BRCL, bromine is 2.8 minus chlorine is 3.0, which gives us an electronegativity difference of 0 0.2. This one falls in the nonpolar covalent range. And so when it's nonpolar covalent, there's an equal sharing of the electrons. And so there is no partial charge. There's no charge at all. And because it's an equal sharing, it'll look more like this, where the electron cloud is equally distributed over the two atoms, resulting in, because of the equal sharing. Okay, um, hydrogen fluoride. I'm running out of blank space on my page. There we go. Here's our scale at the bottom. Okay, HF. Hydrogen is 2.1 minus fluorine, if you recall, is the most electronegative element on the periodic table with an electronegativity of 4.0. And so when I subtract these, I get an electronegativity difference of 1.9. And 1.9 just falls under the 2.0 marking, making this polar covalent. Again, fluorine is more electronegative, so it'll have the partial negative charge, while hydrogen will have the partial positive charge. Next is copper sulfide, copper 2 sulfide to be specific. And copper has an electronegativity of 1.9 minus sulfur, which is 2.5. And this gives me a difference of 0 0.6, which falls again in the polar covalent range. So sulfur is labeled as a partial negative and copper is labeled as a partial positive. Iodine bromide and iodine has 2.5 minus bromine is 2.8, which gives me a difference of 0 0.3, which is right on the edge here. Because it's 0 0.3, we're going to go ahead and call that polar covalent as well, even though it's very close, giving bromine the partial negative and iodine the partial positive. And lastly, we have O2. And oxygen, O2, is what we're comparing is actually an oxygen binded to another oxygen. So it's really going to be 3.5 minus 3.5, which gives you an electronegativity difference of 0.0, .0 and that is most certainly going to fall in the nonpolar covalent range. This will always be the case when you have identical elements bonded to each other. Since they have the same electronegativity, they have a zero pole which makes it nonpolar covalent. Again, that's an equal sharing of the electrons. And so the electron cloud would be evenly distributed around both of them, as opposed to unequally distributed more around one than the other.